not everyone gets to see the reading glasses. It was privilege, and it was privilege. Um, okay, so I flew in from London last night, and I'm really jet lagged and coming out of it, so I'll go as fast as I can. Right. During this presentation, I will show you slides of my work. I hope they'll show you what beauty looks like to me. I'll also use the word crip, a term that's been reclaimed inside disability culture. As a disabled person, I've always had a complicated relationship to beauty. Recently, though, it became a very different kind of question, a problem, really. What happened to me was that I fell in love with someone who tells me several times a day that I'm beautiful. Instead of finding this pleasurable when she says this, I find it rather frightening. And as I say, that's a problem. I'm a person with lifelong physical disabilities, and this has made me quite aware of the ways that variant bodies are judged in both public and in private. This led me also to my engagement with figuration. I make portraits. They start with interviews in which I ask people about the effect that their body has on their life. Some of my subjects are disabled, but some are not. Um, I work in thematic series. These have included circle stories, which explored disability and creativity, totems and familiars, which looked at ways that we use symbols as sources of strength, mirror shards, which uses animal costumes to meditate on loss and transformation, and if body, which examines the invisible bodies which haunt our personal histories. Disabled bodies have been seen as exemplars of what is unbeautiful. Impairments affect normative standards of beauty, such as smoothness, shininess, symmetry, and grace. <coughs> Let us call these the animal standards. <coughs> They've been explained as biological markers that let human animals choose a mate and produce healthy offspring. It turns out that predictability is a great indicator of beauty. Studies say that average proportions and conventional features are much more highly rated than one might think, since the beauty industry um, compels us towards the pursuit of novelty. For many disabled people, when we're told that we're beautiful, it's been a kind of consolation prize, a beauty from the inside thing, which hardly makes you think that you're not a total dog. Or <coughs> crips are told that we are morally exalted and that our beauty has a kind of saintly flavor. We forget that beauty is an illusion. Human beauty is a subjective swamp of taste, history, politics, ideas of health, and the narrowness of fetish. There is virtually no objective standard that goes across all cultures. What you as an individual find beautiful is the sum total of who you are. You fall into love through the rabbit's hole of your own mind, taking your body with you. Yet beauty is a relationship. It's something we bestow on each other, and as such is a power dynamic. When someone calls you beautiful, they're inviting you into a shared illusion. You enter this exalted state by the grace of the beholder. In submitting to be found beautiful, you both gain and lose autonomy as you let another hold the mirror. The story of Narcissus is disturbing because he's locked into his own body and is in no need of anyone else's regard. It's a selfish dead end, but it's also a very protected place. Consider two kinds of beauty. One I call simple beauty, which does not depend on knowing anything about a person. You can tell that they conform with cultural standards, and perhaps with your own taste, but not necessarily. I know, for instance, that Taylor Swift is beautiful, even though she doesn't personally do anything for me. Um, I don't even know, need to know who she is. I think she's a singer. Um, <laughs> to understand why she's on the cover of like a zillion magazines. Simple beauty is a static experience. Your vision does not change, even after many viewings, if nothing new is learned. The other kind, informed beauty, emerges through the gaining of information. It's what happens when you fall in love. The person you're looking at becomes more beautiful as you get to know them, even if you did not find them especially attractive in the beginning. It's counter to novelty, and it comes through a depth and density of knowledge. Informed beauty can cause an actual change in your senses. Your beloved's features become more delicious. Their voice becomes more musical. You don't consciously impose these opinions, but just feel an increase in aesthetic and erotic enjoyment. It is gloriously subjective. Elaine Scari says that beauty is the desire to replicate. 
In love, we want to repeat the encounter and its sensory pleasures. When we fall mutually in love, we experience mutual recognition. It's what we crave from the parent or from God. We want to be completely seen and recognized. In the most intimate detail, it's the gaze that lets you know that you truly exist. Because of the aggressive ways that crypts are stared at, and the kind of upsetting comments we tend to get, we've been made to feel that we're ugly, frightening, and must be fixed. As a result, we've often taken ourselves out of the beauty game. We've feared that getting to know us, becoming informed, means that we will be exposed to our difficult stories, that the true details of our lives will destroy that fragile illusion of beauty. This well may happen if we tell our stories through convoluted pathways of humiliation and concealment. And if we accept the idea that we are beautiful, are we making fools of ourselves? We know that there's a kind of stare that goes on behind our backs, no matter how politely someone might meet our eyes. To be clear, in no way am I saying that beauty is a condonable measure of our value or should be striven for in normative terms. <coughs> but our relationship to beauty matters. It can affect how we take care of ourselves, how we dress, where we go, and what we imagine that we deserve. There are things beyond mere compliments that come with access to beauty. For disabled people, feeling beautiful is a profound relief from shame. Perhaps our bodies can elicit desire, and even welcome being looked at. Shame shuts down the body, makes it protected, opaque, and secretive. It's an exhausting way to live. Even if shame is only relieved in private, at least we get to know what that feels like. And beautiful things are rescued, and they're removed from harm. This can mean everything from personal assistance to political action. If we're not seen as disgusting, but are seen as entities of beauty, we become connected to aesthetic happiness, to art, to nature, and to sensuous and sensual adventures. Connected to communal value, not to pity and to medical isolation. Embodiment makes things visible. The bodies of disabled people show us what gets rewarded and what gets rejected. If you are entirely normative, you might never have to confront these standards. Besides being an artist, I'm also a professor of anatomy, which means that I always think in terms of embodiment. I began to investigate what might be happening in the brain when someone goes through informed beauty. When pleasurable associations take place, they release surges of dopamine in the reward centers. Neural connections are made between disparate facts, such as between the color of a person's hair, person's hair and the delightful way they make us feel. Much research exists about gender differences in how we see beauty and how we determine what's beautiful, but I've read a lot of papers at this point, and I've talked to a lot of scientists, and so far it seems that no one has studied the perceptual shift from something like mild attraction to becoming enamored. In, in other words, what happens is that there's a very static and um, kind of embedded way that we're presented with the idea of beauty in studies. Um, so all I found, for instance, were subjects looking at static pictures and functional MRI machines. There was nothing that addressed changes over time, and this to me is quite indicative of how it, our culture sees beauty, not as an intimate exchange, not as a relationship, but as a yes or no category. Still, associative learning does infer that beholders undergo an embodied change. Since crypts are often in exile from beauty, we're told that we should be grateful to the beholder because through them we are transformed. But the person who invites us into the illusion is changed as well. When someone find, finds the sight of you thrilling, they are not in control. Fascination is not a stable or impregnable place. And I think of this as something you think about in terms of how art operates. Desire only wants to see itself reflected. But informed beauty only works if we're truly known. If it's based on false and unrealistic ideas, then all crypts are being offered is a return to exile. But if we're able to tell genuine stories, then the mutual illusion is as true as any other human exchange. When I do a portrait, I'm always torn between love for the variant body and the desire to provide the complex story behind a person's appearance. I want to collapse informed beauty into a single image. And in a perfect world, Perhaps I would do nothing but nudes because I do so love the variant body. But as long as most viewers reduce nude disabled bodies to mere specimens, it's hard to make that choice. 
The truth is that it took me most of my life to see that beauty. For almost 40 years, when I saw someone with an impairment, all I felt was the panicky desire to flee. Disabled people repelled me, most of all myself. This was in part because none of the crypts I knew had jobs or lovers or homes of their own. We were nearly invisible. I only saw us when I went to the hospital or to a social service organization. I didn't try to see any deeper out of abject terror. In 1997, I found disability culture. Call it mild attraction at the start. My informed view began with an intellectual shift that soon turned into aesthetic rapture. The famous disability rights attorney, Harriet McBride Johnson, said in a 2003 interview in the New York Times, it's not that I'm ugly, it's more that most people don't know how to look at me. I learned to look. I stopped seeing pain and failure behind variation, and instead, what I found was invention and surprise and humor and fresh perspectives. There was a wonderful matter-of-fact quality in the way people talked about their bodies. I was invited into the spacious intimacy of cripples. Crip culture allows us to imagine beauty that has nothing to do with animal standards, beauty with no symmetry. It's possible if we see each other as highly specific bodies, all of us. It is perhaps the most human form of beauty. So when my lover tells me I'm beautiful, I won't ask her what she means. And I might still bristle at my alien position at the border of love. But as an activist, I'll celebrate the shock of my body in bed, and I'll believe in this mutual illusion that sustains both our hearts. <laughs>